Um, I think maybe we'll get started. I don't know if any more people are going to wander in, but uh, I was told to start around 10 o'clock. So thank you all uh, for coming this morning. Uh, my name's David Lindauer. Uh, I've been at Wellesley College for 72 semesters, uh, just about. I, I, that sounds like so much longer than 36 years, and, uh, uh, um, but, but it's been great. Uh, I'm a member of the economics department, but in addition to that, um, I'm the director of this program that we started a few years ago, the Caldwood Seminars Program, and, and that's what I'm here to tell you a little bit about today. Uh, when the organizers of this weekend approached me uh, to speak about this program, it's something new and innovative we're doing at the college, um, I have to admit I, I didn't give a lot of thought to what the title of the talk should be, and, and I came up with this without much thought. Um, and then I thought about it a bit, and I thought, I have a much better title. Um, uh, that's this. Um, but by the time I came up with this, uh, the brochure had already been posted, and nobody wanted to change anything. Uh, so the sentiment expressed in these words comes from an email a Wellesley student wrote her semester, excuse me, her, wrote her professor the semester before last. And I'd like to read you um, a little bit more of the email. So the student wrote, I just ended my internship with the Office of Public Affairs at the Labor Department, that would be the US Labor Department in DC, and wanted to let you know how beneficial last semester's Calderwood was for my work. From drafting the ideal 75 character tweet, editing press releases, to writing blogs on behalf of the department, the workshopping skills from the class have proved extremely useful. My boss was often impressed by both my writing and editing skills and was always curious as to where I picked them up. This further proves that your seminar is still the most beneficial class I have taken at Wellesley. Um, so that class was uh, one taught by Tracy Gleason in the psychology department. It's a call to wood seminar and the title is Psychology in the, in the Public Interest. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this program. Uh, if your uh, students at Wellesley are juniors or seniors, uh, there are six Calderwood seminars being offered in spring, and they might want to uh, enroll in one of them. And if your students are first years or sophomores, a little bit of planning ahead and thinking about something they might look forward to taking. Um, when they're juniors or seniors, and, and for everyone in the room, I'm going to describe a program that, as far as we can tell, is, is really unique to Wellesley College. We, we have not found a program quite like this at any other institution. Um, Calderwood Seminars asks students to reflect on what they've learned in their majors by having them translate what they've learned um, in their, their field of study in, into a language that a college friend, a sibling, even a parent might understand. Um, and this is something we don't ask college students to do often enough. Um, explaining something to a non-expert requires a really deep understanding of one's field, and I think that embodies what a liberal arts education is intended to provide. Uh, we're in the fourth year of the program right now, it's named after Stanford Calderwood, who is a, uh, the late Stanford Calderwood, I should say, passed away over a decade ago. And, and Stan was a, a major philanthropist in the Boston area. If you go to the MFA, there's a, a Calderwood garden, there's a, a courtyard, rather, there's uh, one at the Fogg Museum. Uh, many, many cultural institutions in the Boston area have benefited from uh, Stan's generosity, and Wellesley does as well, and we have received a generous grant for this program from the Caldwood Charitable Foundation. Um, by the end of this year, we will have introduced 18 Caldwood seminars. Uh, over 350 students will have enrolled with them, so we're at a point where about 16% of the student body of a graduating class, rather, uh, will take one of these seminars, so it's kind of having a significant impact on our students. Um, I, I'd like to say that we offer um, Calderwood seminars uh, from A to Z, but Wellesley doesn't have a zoology department, so we only can go from A to W, uh, from American Studies to the writing program. 
Uh, there's a, a good mix of seminars um, across the disciplines and the humanities, the social sciences, and the sciences. Um, next semester, I'm delighted that we're going to be offering, a, 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 for the first time, a, a Caldwood in Mathematics, the one in the upper corner there, Mathematics 340. And I think some of these, these courses have uh, in, intriguing titles, uh, Ethics for Everyone, the Philosophy Caldwood is one of my personal favorites. And the math one, when I, I spoke with Karen Lang about introducing a, a writing course in mathematics that, that almost sounds like an oxymoron, I said, we're really going to have to work you know, a little bit hard on, on marketing this course to make sure students sign up for it. And her first title was Expository Mathematics. And I said, Karen, I'm not so sure that's so good. So I countered. I said, how about math for the masses? And she said, I don't think that's going to fly with my department colleagues for a 300-level course. So we, we settled on explaining mathematics. Um, as the name of uh, the program implies, these, sem these seminars involve public writing as distinct from academic writing. Uh, public writing, we like to define it as the ability to translate complex arguments and professional jargon to a broad audience is different from academic writing, the academic writing that's done in most courses, and is central. Um, I think public writing is central to success beyond college. One student wrote uh, in an email to her professor, I feel like my first year writing course was writing for college, and this class was writing for life. Uh, very nice sentiment. Uh, but Caldwood seminars are much more than writing intensive electives. Uh, they're 300 level courses in specific disciplines. And in many cases, they're designed for a student to take stock of what she's learned in her major over the preceding seven semesters or six semesters. Um, and they do so in a way that I think is different from the traditional 300 level course. So let me explain to you the Calderwood difference. I think the structure of most majors looks something like this, that you begin with some 100-level course, which is an overview of a discipline. It gives you a very broad introduction to a field. You move on to the 200-level course, which narrows uh, to a, 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 a more specific area of the discipline. At the 300 level, you're getting even more focused on a a smaller subtopic within the field. And, and perhaps at the top of that triangle would be writing a senior thesis, which in some ways is the narrowest focus we can imagine at the college level. Um, the Calderwood concept is meant to be complementary to this to give students a different opportunity, which is at the 300 level to once again appreciate the breadth of the field, um, to s begin to think like a psychologist, a biologist, an economist, whatever the field is, and to give the student the opportunity um, perhaps to take one more lap around her major. Calderwood seminars achieve these goals in the particular pedagogic approach. We refer to it as the mechanics of these courses. And to explain this, I want to use, uh, give you a tour of the course that I teach. It's a Calderwood seminar in economics, which the title is Economic Journalism, which I'll be teaching again uh, in spring. So the basic structure of Calderwood seminars, um, we cap these at 12 students. Um, they're relatively small, even for Wellesley College. Uh, in majors, so my course tends to have 12 students. In majors which are smaller, let's say religion or music, these seminars could have even fewer students. But I'll talk about my class with its, uh, usually its 12 students. So the class is divided into two groups, A and B. It's kind of arbitrary. And each week, students serve as either writers or editors. And they'll switch those roles every week. And to explain exactly how this process works and how these courses are really different from just about anything else when one takes at Wellesley, um, I'm going to focus on one week in my class. And that was week five, and this was the last time I taught the course, which was in spring of 2015. 
And week five of the class was devoted to the presidential address by Claudia Golden uh, delivered at the 2014 meeting of the American Economics Association. And Claudia Golden is a distinguished economic historian and labor economist. Uh, she holds the Henry Lee Professor of Economics Chair at Harvard. And the title of her talk was um, this presidential address was something called a grand gender convergence. And it's about pay differentials between men and women in the professions, uh, in law, in business, in medicine, and in, in, in IT. And this was a, an article, an address, um, that she was delivering to the American Economics Association, to PhD economists. She was not delivering this address with undergraduate economics majors at Wellesley in mind. Um, it's a subtle analysis on a compelling social issue. It's also a difficult paper. Um, that's the first page of it. I just wanted to show you that it looks like an e what you think of as an economics paper if you've never, you've never read one. It's got lots of Greek letters. It has equations. On other pages, it has lots of statistical analysis. And what's important here is that in signing this paper to the class, we had no discussion about this paper before we met on the Thursday of the fifth week of the class. There was no preparation, no previous discussion in class. What students had to turn to was three and a half years of being an economics major. It was their prior courses, which were their preparation for our class meeting. And to appreciate the challenge that, that students faced each week in the class, I want to introduce you um, to one of the writers in week five who had to write about Claudia Golden's address. And that's Narayani Gupta. And I'll tell you a little bit about Narayani. A um, bit of an aside, Narayani um, is an Indian national. She came to Wellesley as an international student. And um, while she was here, she got, uh, at the end of her junior year, an internship at Bank of America. And that led to a job offer. She liked Bank of America. They liked her. She went to Bank of America after she took the Calderwood Seminar and she graduated. Um, and she went to New York City. Um, and she was very happy there. But then an unfortunate, well, maybe not, turn of events is that because she's an Indian national, she doesn't have a green card. And so she entered the H-1B lottery to permit her to stay. And she lost. And so in relatively short notice, she had to leave the country. But she didn't really want to leave Bank of America. And Bank of America liked her, had trained her a lot. So I recently got an email that she's delighted to be living in Sydney, Australia, working for Bank of America. Um, but we're going to talk about the challenges that uh, Narayani faced uh, a little bit before that as a student in, in my class. So what did Narayani have to do? Well, she and her 11 classmates, they had to first start off and read Professor Golden's AEA address. And they had to do that before uh, we met on Thursday of that fifth week. And what Narayani's task was, was to write 800 words. That's about the size of an op-ed and of many articles in a standard newspaper. Um, and she had to figure out what did the what was Professor Golden talking about? How did she make her points? And why would anyone other than a bunch of economists at the AE meeting care? And you would be amazed at how having to write only 800 words on a complex subject that your mom and dad can understand, that really focuses the mind. And so this was Narayani's challenge. Now, specifically what she had to do is she had to get her 800-word story on a grand gender convergence to her editor for that week. And these writer-editor pairings changed every week. So every student got to work with just about everybody else in the class. And her editor for this week was, was, was Kathy Long. And um, editors had very specific instructions. And um, Kathy had a comment on both the substance of Narayani's argument in her eight words, 800 words, and also on uh, re offer recommendations about how to improve the writing of the piece. And Kathy did her job very well. 
Uh, these are the track changes um, of Kathy's comments on Narayani's piece. Uh, as you can see, Kathy wrote just about as many words about Narayani's piece as Narayani wrote. Um, and each student is re uh, required to make uh, comments, line comments, but also summary comments, which are the ones in red. So armed with these comments, what Narayani then had to do is she had to revise her, her piece and she had to um, post it to the course's Google group. This is our online form of communication in the class. And she had to get it, her, her sort of first complete draft for the class to read by 9 a.m. on Wednesday morning. That's about 30 hours before the class met. Um, by 9 a.m., our Google group had six articles. Uh, there were six writers that week. And virtually no one ever missed a deadline. And I think the reason for that is less than that they are intimidated by me, but more that they didn't want to let their peers down. Um, so we now had six 800-word pieces on Claudia Golden's um, address in our Google group. And the other thing we had was Rashomon. Now, I've given this talk to a few other audiences, and I'm never quite sure if this cultural reference is one that resonates with my audience, so I'll explain what it means. And, 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 and some of you may be familiar with it, and others uh, perhaps not. Um, I, once I gave this talk, and I, I got to this point, and later a, a member of the audience came up to me and said, you know, my dad always used to talk about Rashomon, and I had no idea what it meant, and I'm so happy you explained it. So what Rashomon refers to, um, there's a film, the poster from the film by the renowned Japanese director, uh, Kira Kurosawa, and this film is based on a Japanese, a medieval Japanese folktale. And the folktale runs something like this, that a samurai, his wife, and a bandit meet in the woods and have a violent encounter. Each of the three then recounts his or her version of what happened, as does a woodcutter who observed the events. So four people witnessed this violent encounter, and the film is about each person's version of what had transpired. And of course, all four have completely different versions of, of this event. So without the violent encounter, what we had in my class was Rashomon. We had six people, read the same article, and saw completely different things in it. And um, everyone came to class, then prepared to discuss this difference in, in perspective. Before class, every student had read Claudia Golden's piece. Every student had participated either as a writer or editor for that week. And everyone was really prepared to discuss the material. Um, from both a faculty member and a student perspective, this is just a wonderful learning opportunity in class. Um, there's no better situation when everybody is prepared to discuss something because they've heavily invested in the topic before. Sure, professors can say, please read x or y before we meet next time. I never did that as a student. I don't really expect most of my students to do it now. But the design of these courses requires that everybody be fully engaged with the material before we meet in class. So we met in class. And um, I didn't have a picture of my class. And, and that's Jay Turner. Uh, he teaches an ES environmental seminar. And uh, I have a picture of his seminar. And mine looks very similar. So what did we do in class when we met? Well. We spent the first half discussing Claudia Golden's article. I had the opportunity to read what the six students wrote and could distill from that what they understood and perhaps what they didn't understand about the economic arguments that Professor Golden was presenting. So I would tailor that first hour discussion um, to uh, what I thought they had missed. And then the second half of class was devoted to workshopping the individual stories that were written for that week, spending about 10 or 15 minutes on each one of them. Um, students weren't all that good at doing this at first, because it's not something we ask them to do very often. But they got much, much better at it as the semester progressed. Um, 
throughout all of the Caldwood, Caldwood seminars, students repeatedly talk about peer editing and workshops as highlights of the experience and something very different than they, um, they get the opportunity to do in other classes. They really appreciate writing for an audience other than their professor. They really are writing for one another. Um, it was also hard for students at first to, to give and receive criticism of their work. Um, the first weeks of Calderwood seminars, students almost always preface their comments by, I may be wrong, or don't take this personally, or I'm not sure. And those disappear by the end of the semester and get extremely blunt by the end. <laughs> um, so at the end of that class session, the end of that Thursday meeting, once again, Naraini had a lot to think about. So what had transpired? Well, we had spent two and a half hours talking about Claudia Golden's piece, and Naraini learned more about that piece than she had known at the beginning. Uh, she had read the work of her five other classmates and what they got out of it and saw things that she hadn't figured out. Uh, she had listened to their often pointed comments on her piece, and she also got my written comments uh, on her 800 words as well. And what Naraini's task was by the sixth week, by the time class would meet one week later, was she had to rewrite her piece. She had to write a final draft of it with all of that input. In that way, every student in a Calderwood seminar is writing either a first or a final draft every week for 12 weeks, and nothing improves your writing more than writing every week. Uh, Naraini, though, had another challenge in week six. Now she was the editor on the assignment for week six. And in week six, she was Stella's editor. And the assignment was to write a book review of uh, The Climate Casino. This is a book uh, that was published a few years ago by William Nordhaus, a very distinguished professor, economics prof <coughs> professor at Yale University that deals with the economics of climate change. Every week in economic journalism was a new beginning. We had a, a new task, a new focus for our discussion. And we spanned the discipline. Sometimes we talked about gender pay gaps, sometimes about climate change, sometimes about the federal deficit, sometimes about income inequality. And so as I said earlier, in these courses, and mine in particular, um, seniors get to take one more lap around the major they get to review material they've learned in previous courses, and they really begin to realize that they can take what they've learned and apply it to subjects they haven't thought about before, and to begin to discover their voices as fledgling economists. Now, the course mechanics I've descri just described are pretty common across all the Calderwood seminars. We all use writers and editors. We all do in-class Workshop, um, workshopping, we all have peer editing, we all have first and final drafts. We also tend to use similar assignments. Uh, those happen to be the six assignments that I use. And many other faculty have their students writing op-eds, um, conducting interviews of professionals in the field, writing book reviews, etc. cetera. Uh, Calderwood seminars in the humanities tend to be a little bit different because students in the humanities don't tend to have a common core of courses they've all taken. Um, so in the humanities, there are, uh, there's a tendency not to use the approach I use, which we call the common text approach, which leads to these Rashomon moments. Instead, we, they use what we refer to as a common genre report, excuse me, a common genre approach where every student is, say, writing a letter to the editor or posting a blog post, but maybe on something different. Uh, it lends to a little bit more personal narratives and creative writing, but equally rewarding seminar experiences. Uh, in some cases, Students get to publish their work. Um, this is the published article of one of Naraini's submissions that she did with another member in class. Um, this was her op-ed about uh, America's soda consumption and whether or not 
um, there should be a sugar tax in the United States, and it was published in, in, in um, Huffington Post. Um, in Lynn Vitti's Call to Wood seminar in Law, Medicine, and Ethics, she requires every student to attempt to publish their work. Uh, last semester, I believe everybody did. And one member of her class um, had a piece on religious literacy and organ donations that was published in the Quincy Patriot Ledger, a, a newspaper in, in a community not too far from here. And two other local newspapers, after seeing the piece, picked it up and published it as well in, in the towns of Brockton and Sharon. And um, this student wrote of this accomplishment, I lack the eloquence to describe my pride um, at, at, at these publications. Now, I've had the, the chance to um, present talks similar, this, similar to this one to different audiences over the past year or two. And I often fall back in what I, I've done today, which is I describe this program of 18 seminars by focusing on my class, because that's the one I know the best. And I, I came to the realization that if I'm trying to explain our program to different audiences, I, I had to be able to go beyond my own experience. And so last spring, I decided to um, ask my colleagues if I could visit their classes and sit in and see what was going on. And it was a wonderful experience. I, I think it might have been akin to what the, the late musician Prince must have experienced when he went to concerts and saw other musicians covering his songs. Um, I got to see other faculty cover a public writing course similar to the one that I teach. Um, I got, had the great fortune of meeting, and, and, and not meeting, but listening, watching, uh, some of the really remarkable professors in the college, Dan Chasen in the English department, Barry Lydgate in the French and Complit program, Steve Marini in religion, and Lynn Vitti in the writing program. And while there were important differences between the seminars uh, in terms of content and approach, there was also things that felt very, very familiar to me, and I refer to them as the three E's and an O. Um, First was the palpable energy in the classroom. Second, the engagement of all students with no one left at the margins of the class. Third, the enthusiasm from students and faculty alike. And finally, the ownership that students had over in-class discussion. In many of these seminars, it wasn't even clear the professor had to be there. I've visited a lot of classes at Wellesley. I've been in the faculty for a long time, and class visits are, are part of what senior faculty do. And attending these four classes, they just felt different from, from virtually any other course I had ever attended. So to sort of sum up a bit, what do students learn from their call to wood seminars? First, they learn about their major. Uh, these courses empower students in the knowledge that they've gained in their previous courses, and that's why we offer them at the 300 level and see them as a, 300, as a senior level elective. They get to take one more lap around their major, getting to think like an economist, a biologist, a psychologist, et cetera, and they begin to find what their own voices in the field. These courses, of course, also improve student writing. Um, they help students navigate uh, the fairly large space between public writing and academic writing. And they tell us about the compliments they're getting from everything from writing good cover letters from, for jobs to writing good memos, as that quote I read you at the beginning of my talk suggests. They also learn the importance of establishing an, a context for what they write about and are amazed that they're entitled to have opinions about intellectual um, material, something that strikes them in a way that, that uh, other courses don't necessarily do, that yes, you can have an opinion, whether it's in biology or it's in religion or it's in some other field. Um, their writing also improves from uh, doing it so frequently. Uh, they get rid of a terrible habit of academic writing, which is that in, you write a term paper, you sort of don't get to the point until the end. And when you're doing public writing, 
you got to get to the point in the first paragraph, otherwise no one's going to read anymore. And this is a real shock that this is a good idea. Um, they also learn that a first draft is not a final draft. And unfortunately, in college, first drafts very often are the final draft. And that's not what life after college is like. I'm not entirely happy with referring to this as soft skills. But I haven't come up for a better term. And this is, again, what students are telling us about their experience. Um, they love to see the work of their peers. Again, I'll quote from something a student wrote. She said, education is a funny system. You spend 16 years in the classroom, but you hardly ever get to read the work of your classmates. Certainly, that sort of academic isolation allows you to develop your own voice, but it also deters collaborative learning. Calderwood seminars permit students, and permit, they're required to write for someone other than their professor. They get to see what their peers do, and this proves to be very liberating for students. They learn how to give and receive criticism from one another, a lifelong skill that we should probably be encouraging much more. And they become better and more skeptical readers. Uh, many, many students have told me that they now don't believe everything they read in the New York Times, and that's a, a good lesson. Students have been overwhelmingly positive about their experience in these seminars. Uh, they recognize all the points that I've just described. They tell us how these seminars improve their command over their disciplines and how it improves their writing, and that these improvements spill over to other courses if they take it before their final semester at college and also their work experience after graduating. They also tell us about the unique bond that forms in, with their classmates in these courses that just feels different from any other course they've taken at the college. And that seems very special. Um, I'm going to conclude now by reading to you three more quotes about student experiences taking different Calderwoods that really captures, I think, um, our enthusiasm for the program. Uh, the first quote was from a student who graduated last year and took Barry Lydgate's Calderwood seminar that's jointly offered as an elective in comparative literature and French. She writes, looking back on my four years at Wellesley, I feel like a lot of what we do is preparing for the collegiate setting. But this seminar felt like preparation for life in a way that reassured me that the skills I have worked so hard to improve are applicable and necessary. I bet if she showed that to her parents, they would have felt pretty good hearing that, too. From a student in my economic journalism class from a few years back, she wrote, the skills I learned in economic journalism are serving me very well at CEA. Uh, she was a research assistant at the Council of Economic Advisors in Washington. That's the CEA. She writes, I write pages and pages every day, and most of my writing is aimed at a general audience. I often get calls asking me for writing help. This morning, I was asked to translate from econ robot to human, a skill I am now apparently known for. <laughs> and lastly, the student who I mentioned earlier who had, uh, was so proud of that piece that was published in the Quincy Patriot Ledger and was picked up by two other newspapers, she writes, in middle school, I once sought comfort from my father after a middle school teacher devastated one of my essays with red ink. Instead of criticizing the teacher for his harsh grading, my father said, good, the worst thing would have been no red ink on your essay, because that means you can't improve. Each day in writing 390 echoed my father's words. The class challenged me to think critically and deeply and to read about bioethics issues and how they affect all of us. It ingrained in me the skills to be a better public writer and editor. Writing 390 is one of the most important classes I have taken at Wellesley, and one of the few I am sure to remember in the next decades. Calderwoods should be requirements at Wellesley. They encapsulate what it means to be a liberal arts student. Thank you. So we have time. Um, there's another lecture coming in here in 11. I'm happy to take some questions, sir. Uh, my daughter is in the mathematics department. I missed the first five minutes. Are these offered every term, every year, in every department? No. Um, this program um, 
has been financed by a very generous donor, but the amount of resources we have have restricted us to offering about uh, between eight and 10 a year. So we have many, many more. You know, I think Wellesley has something like 50 different majors and programs. Um, also, faculty have a lot of different demands on their times for different electives. Departments require them to teach. So um, they're rotating. So I know, for example, in mathematics, the uh, Call to Wit seminar is being introduced for the first time this spring. And the professor can't repeat it next year, but hopes to get into an every other year cycle. So I think, you know, I'm delighted that we got up to a scale of about 15, per, 15 16 percent of the student body are, are able to take one of these classes. It would be difficult for the institution to push it much higher than that, I think. Really, I, you know, at the career services, uh, education services uh, presentation yesterday, they said that employers tell them that writing and expressing themselves are the two things that they can't teach and the most important things for college graduates to have. Well, what I can say is this program is fairly unique. We, we do not know of any other liberal arts college or, or university that's teaching something like this. So. I'm feeling great that after three years, we've got, we, we've been able to introduce 18 of them. And uh, you know, if, if you have a, a younger daughter and she, you know, maybe six years from now, you can come back and see, maybe, maybe we've gotten that percentage up. Any other questions? Sir? Yeah, so the way you describe this, it's sort of taking maybe academic work and translating it for the public. Uh, do any of the courses <coughs> focus Maybe more on taking academic work and translating it for practitioners, or is that, or is that sometimes what some of your students end up doing? So, for instance, taking biological or medical research and translating it for practitioners. Um, I'm trying to think. So, I'm, I'm trying to interpret your question in the field I know best, which was my own. So. If I, if I think of economists, I guess there are no economics practitioners in the same way that, that biology would be for doctors. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we're doing that explicitly, but I'm not sure if there's a continuum from academic writing to public writing and, and practitioners are somewhere in the middle of that continuum. I would like to believe that we're getting close to that by moving away from the academic style to the public style. The other thing about making this material work is that pieces tend to be limited to about 800 to 1,000 words. Um, and if you sort of appreciate the mechanics of the course, if we were getting up to 2,000 words, we couldn't do a lot of what we do or, or more. And it may be that the practitioner needs to have that additional material. Um, I would hope that a Wellesley student who had learned successfully to do academic writing one end of the continuum and public writing through this course would then be well positioned. What I think you're suggesting is something in the middle between those two poles. That would be my hope. Yeah. Can you speak to how this might translate to public speaking as opposed to public <coughs> writing? The college has a public speaking initiative too and um, I think those are distinct skills, per, perhaps related, but they're distinct. I think the things that are, are related is, is providing a good context, um, understanding your audience. Those are things that both of those, um, uh, both public speaking and public writing require. Then there's another part of public speaking, which is um, don't fidget. Uh, you know, all the performance art part, which is, is not part of this. And it's interesting that you ask that because some faculty in the program have wanted students to do podcasts and do videos as one of the assignments. And they found th this is a course that has a very um, assembly-like feel to it. You know, you're, you're writing, you're rewriting, you're writing, you're rewriting. There's a new topic every week. You, you've got to stay on that conveyor belt. And the faculty who've tried to add in, um, do a, like a, a two-minute TED talk or do a podcast, have found that the technology required that you need to get command of to do that doesn't fit well within this cycle that 
and therefore it detracts from the overall flow of the semester. So they most have backed away. They've, they've tried it and then they just got overwhelmed with the technical part and felt that the trade-off wasn't worth it. And the college has invested heavily in this public writing initiative, excuse me, public speaking initiative, which is tied to other courses, but not this one. Thanks. Sure. Well, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend.